the bulk of my research focuses on public election funding and other campaign finance reforms uh, at the state level. But I also work on uh, election reforms that focus on undervoting, uh, aberrant voting and election administration. And I've got a separate stream that studies how voters uh, judge politicians accused of scandal and corruption. The public funding stuff, I think, connects to my background, which is as a political strategist and at times a campaign manager for federal candidates. And I worked for a fair number of people who lost. And just about always, uh, you know, you'd be sitting in that darkened room having conceded to the congressman, right? And they would say, imagine what we could have done if only we'd had the money. And that's when I started getting interested in public funding. So I went, when I left that world and went back to grad school, I knew that's what I wanted to study. Uh, and in the dissertation, uh, my doctoral dissertation, that's what I did study. And went in depth with uh, legislative candidates in 18 states to find out what they did if only they had the money from these public grants. I'm heading out on Monday to hear arguments in McComish v. Bennett which is a case that's coming out of Arizona that's challenging the matching funds provisions of this program that I'm studying. Uh, it's a funny story. Uh, I was just a grad student and I had this little idea. And so I went down to Arizona after the 2006 election and I talked to candidates. And what they told me was, uh, you know, so Blake, if I run against you and I take the public money in Arizona and you don't, I don't have to raise any money. But say you raise 20000 more than, than I do, the state of Arizona will, will write me a check to, uh, to, to keep us on an even playing field. Well, the, the candidates who would be in your situation recognize that, well, I, I have an incentive to not raise money. And so now they've brought a First Amendment suit saying that, that this law chills their speech. And I have the unique position of being cited by both sides on this case. The candidates who, whose speech is being chilled, I'm... I think the only person who's written a paper on, on that phenomena. And then all my other work, which kind of shows that, hey, clean elections is not a, not a bad thing altogether. So, yeah, I'm sort of in the middle of it. It's been really fun. And I, 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 want, I, I hope that, that, that we can matter uh, and inform the judiciary. The Illinois undervote provision that was enacted in time for the 2010 primary gave me a chance to study something that's happening right here and affecting voters in Illinois. So I studied uh, this, this law, which if you fail to vote for a statewide office, uh, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you just don't like any of the candidates, when you cast that ballot, it, the system beeps at you and kicks the, the ballot out. I was curious to find out uh, how that actually affected undervotes. I suspected it wouldn't because I think that most of the time when people don't vote, it's because they just don't want to. And that's pretty much what I found. Uh, we're spending a lot of money here in Illinois to implement a program that I can't find much evidence uh, to support. I try to produce things that the people, not just political scientists, but policymakers, and, and I suppose some concerned citizens would be interested in, in reading. Uh, in hopes that, you know, maybe we can do a little bit better. Yeah, I have a paper coming out at the end of the year uh, on evaluating how voters uh, judge politicians accused of scandal. I got the idea for Mark San from Mark Sanford, actually, when he was accused of adultery in South Carolina. I told my wife, I said, well, I, I don't know. I think uh, South Carolina being so Republican, I think maybe voters will, will let him off because you've got a Republican governor. And she said, are you crazy? Uh, South Carolina is a very religious state. So, uh, you know, so I got really interested in the differential sort of effects and how people judge politicians accused of different sorts of scandals. So with uh, two co-authors from Yale, I put a survey instrument in, in, onto an online survey. So people think they're just taking a little survey, but really what we're doing is experimentally manipulating the type of scandal that people were accused of. And what we found uh, was that financial scandals, like tax evasion, are judged a lot more harshly than moral scandals, uh, like adultery. And that when people abuse their, their office, the powers of their office, voters pick up on that and judge them even more harshly. So if you're going to have a scandal, don't uh, commit tax fraud and then offer to give the auditor a job in your office, I suppose.
one of the things that I learned from a mentor in grad school was that you ought to teach what you write and write what you teach. And I think it gives you a profound ability to connect with students and talk about why what they're reading matters, at least why it matters to me as a researcher. Uh, and so when, I, when I'm teaching a paper that I've written, I not only can discuss the findings and the importance, but I can talk about process, how I did what I did, how long and arduous it was. Uh, and I think students really appreciate hearing that and connecting with it. I think it's really easy in politics, particularly in the contemporary political environment, to rely on anecdote instead of evidence. If we don't provide the public with evidence, empirical, solid, scientific evidence, who will? Uh, and that's what I see my job as being, is, is giving policymakers and recently the judiciary the tools that uh, I hope will be used properly to make good policy decisions.